Hi, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Catherine Clark. Conservative MP Eve Adams is a first-generation Canadian who grew up in a hard-working Ontario family. She became a parliamentary page at the age of 18, and she sat for seven years on Mississauga City Council before deciding to run federally. Eve Adams joins me now to talk about a very busy life beyond politics. <laughs> Eve Adams, welcome to Beyond Politics. It's great to have you here. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, you um, uh, you have such an interesting story because, in fact, you're a first-generation Canadian. Your yes. Your parents came to Canada. In fact, they, they fled Hungary, yes. uh, communist Hungary, to come to Canada. Do you know why they chose Canada? Oh, well, they both came separately. Did so they? My dad... So they didn't even know each other no, when they came. Wow. No, they met in North America. Yeah. Uh, so my dad came actually uh, during the revolution. So Soviet tanks were coming through Budapest, and uh, and he fled during that time. And he was one of ten children, and uh, he eventually made his wow. way to Canada. He went through Paris and uh, the United States, and eventually settled in Canada. Worked on a farm in Welland, and um, just took about every tough job you can imagine, and ended up working in the mines in Sudbury, and found some prosperity there, and saved up some money, and uh, wanted to become an entrepreneur. And then my mother came in the early 70s, mm -hmm. and uh, she was visiting some relatives uh, down in the United States, and it was incredibly difficult to even come on a visit. Uh, the, the communist regime uh, was in full swing in, in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can imagine, there's, there's no consumer goods on shelves, and you need to wait in bread lines in order to get products. And you can't speak freely. I mean, you can see with your own eyes clearly uh, that the regime is, uh, is is deficient in many respects. The economy is struggling. Uh, you can see just how hungry your neighbors are, how difficult it is for you to survive, and you couldn't speak openly about that uh, for fear of retribution. And, and I think I think we forget just how recently that was taking yeah. place in Europe, and and how many people were suffering under that. Uh, and the fact that, you know, a country has to keep its residents within its borders. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that speaks volumes. If you can't move freely, um, there's something seriously wrong there. And so they came. So my mother came to the U.S. and uh, she met with my dad. And How did they meet? Uh, actually, through social circles. Okay. Through social circles. Yeah. And, uh, and they decided to get married. And we always joke because she went to visit relatives in Daytona Beach, Florida. Right. She'd never been to Sudbury. Oh, my gosh. She was going to Daytona Beach, and then she <laughs> she married she a man from Sudbury. Sudbury. Yes, oh yes. My gosh. Where the winters are a little bit tougher. Yeah, than they're, they might they're be slightly in cooler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little darker. But wonderful people, really down to earth people, a uh, great community, right. and uh, and so they they worked awfully hard. Uh, they started up uh, renting gas stations, and then they eventually saved up enough money and bought gas stations. And she would run the variety store. She'd have the playpen in the variety store. Wow. Going in and out, pumping gas. Um, That's amazing. She really is. Long, long hours. Tell me about how the, um, the experience of living within that communist regime affected her once she was here. I mean, did she talk about, um, either positively or negatively, really recognizing the value of, of what she had here in Canada? or it kind of constraining her in some ways. Did she ever talk about that, or did you ever notice that about her? Every day. Really? Every, every day at the kitchen table, just how awful things were. She was incredibly homesick. She'd left her family, all of her friends, wow. her community, uh, and she didn't speak the language. To this day, she speaks broken English. Yeah. Really, really great broken English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she didn't take classes, nor did my dad. And so they always struggled uh, filling out any paperwork, and they always felt it was a, a very big challenge for them uh, to compete here in Canada and to build a better life. So they would. They would yearn for the days, you know, where, where they were. It was easier for them. You know, my mother had an office job back in Hungary. She was a statistician, uh, and her family was there, and she wanted to be with them. But every day she would talk about, you know, like, there just isn't food. No matter how hard you work, no matter how long you're willing to work, there just isn't food. We're hungry. Um, so did that, um, were they ever unhappy that they had made the decision to come to Canada? Or despite it all, they knew that this was the right place for them to be? All along, and they entrenched deeply in, in my brothers and I, this 
this deep respect for how fortunate we were to be here uh, and how much better our lives were. And, and they knew that they were struggling yeah. very much. I think now, to be fair, now that Europe is prospering so much relative to, mm -hmm. to what she had left, like she left abject poverty, yeah. sort of post-war uh, circumstances, mm -hmm. communist regimes, like they had absolutely nothing. Um, to go back now and she's there with her friends and her former schoolmates, there's a sense of nostalgia. So I, I don't know if that's necessarily a fair comparison. Sure, no. that's interesting. Would they consider going back, do you think? Well, she goes back in the summer for about a month. That's nice. Because um, her friends and her cousins are mm -hmm. all aging. You can imagine, right? Like there's yeah. villages and villages of folks there and everybody seems to be related to everyone. I'm sure. And that's, I think that was the toughest thing for her, right? Yeah. So as a child, you would come home and she'd be playing you know, Hungarian records and crying and just missing her, her sure. siblings. As you would miss your siblings. Absolutely. Right? Um, so it was this big struggle. But but just they would constantly compliment just how incredible this was, that you could. You could speak about the fact that you didn't like your political leaders here and how everyone could speak about that freely at, at right. Tim Hortons. And that just didn't exist back in Hungary. Now that you're one of them, she might not like that so much. <laughs> she, okay. she might not like that. Oh, she's, she's pretty fair in her critiques, <laughs> actually. Really good sense. Yeah. Of make sure that I'm always self-deprecating. That's right. Good, yeah. good and humble. Yeah. That's right. Well, no, no. She's, she's fair in her criticisms. Yeah. And you know what? When she points out something, she's usually right, as most moms are. And moms. I know. It's the mom thing. It is. Um, you it is. entered, as far as I knew, kindergarten. Yes. Um, but need, but still, we're not speaking uh, English. You you took an ESL yeah. program, is that right? In yes. kindergarten, yes, that's so interesting. But that must happen to thousands of families, frankly, yes. in Canada. In Mississauga, Brampton South, yeah. which is the area that I represent, uh, we have a very large South Asian population, and it's it's actually quite the norm. We have about ninety percent incoming ESL classes in kindergarten. Wow! And it, you know, part of it is, and I, I so understand this. Yeah. Uh, my family was very insular. You know, they're busy working. Uh, what free time they do have, they want to be with some friends. And, yeah. you know, they haven't yet picked up the language. And so when they have children, they're still, one, I think, wanting to pass on the Absolutely. culture and the heritage. Uh, and then secondly, there just isn't that much time in a day. And you're tired anyways. <laughs> yes. And it requires an extra effort to teach that. And um, she didn't speak English. Yeah. So, you know, you speak to your child and and what is easiest for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have memories of it, though, going into kindergarten? And I remember it well. I remember not understanding. And, I, you know, I also remember, though, as the year would progress, teachers still saying to other children around me, oh, explain it to her. She can't understand you. And it, it was a very, um, very eye-opening experience that I've always carried with me. Just because people can't express themselves doesn't mean they don't understand quite a bit more than you think. Right. Has it impacted how you treat other people? Of course. Yeah. Of course. And um, you were described uh, as a really good student, though, like someone who was meticulous, and you took those lovely neat notes <laughs> that um, always uh, completely failed me. But I don't, did you really I, apply yourself as a student, or was it just something that you enjoyed? You know, I, you do have a sense that, um, that, that you want to prove yourself and make sure that your parents' investment uh, uh, was well-served and, and, and well-placed. Well um, I, I think there is amongst all sorts of first-generation Canadians this immense amount of guilt uh, that you want to do well so that your parents, who you see struggling, mm. right, um, can feel proud and feel reassured in their choices. Um, it's tough, you know. I, I would see my parents until 2 a.m. out there. Uh, and pumping gas was very different than it is today. Today it's self-serve. Mm -hmm. But way back then it was out in the snow and the cold. And in Sudbury it's awfully cold. And they still kept the gas station there even after we'd moved down south. Um, so there were very long, hard hours. And then when they had the restaurant, you know, when your staff don't show up. Mm -hmm. You're it. You are it. You're the one cooking in the kitchen. You're the one cleaning in the bathroom. You're still the one, though, that has to do um, your inventory orders. You still have to write your payroll. And, uh, and they couldn't read and write properly. Mm -hmm. And so they would often turn to us and ask us for assistance. And so there we would be 12 years old writing up menus from scratch, right, and, and assisting them with, with you know, their, their ROEs, right, uh, and, and you name it, whether it was their um, balance of loss statements. We would, we would assist them because it was just difficult and they'd have to go to a lawyer each time mm -hmm. to have something translated. Did you resent it as kids or was it just part of life? Um, it was the norm. So, of course, every child wants to go and play with their friends, mm -hmm. right? And you, or watch TV. Um, but your parents would just say, we need help. And right. that, was, that was the key. Help me, please. Right. So, hmm. 
but it was also nice. I mean, looking back, it was wonderful to spend all that time with them. Uh, my dad has since passed away, and he had a really sort of terrible illness where his legs were amputated three times. Oh my gosh! So, um, so you know, you're very, um, you're very grateful for the time that you do have together. Yeah. And if we weren't there when they were working, we would not have seen them. Did you pump the ass too? Of did course. You, you did, eh? Of course. Wow. Of course. That's a really good way to, um, that's a good beginning in life, and I think, because you recognize the value of your hard work. Of I mean, course. if you just see other people doing it, you don't have anywhere near the same appreciation of having had to do it yourself. And wash the windshield and check yes. your oil. <laughs> I can, you can do all of that? I can open just about any kind of car hood. <laughs> that's awesome. These are skills that will serve you well for the rest they of your are. life. <laughs> and it's good cocktail information, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you know from an early age what you wanted to do in life? Did you have a clear you mean sense? to go into politics eventually? Yeah, or anything. I mean, did you think, oh, I'm going to be a, you know, a doctor or a, I'm going to be an astronaut? Or had you got a clear sense of politics? Um. Probably public policy development, and then I sort of went on the accounting fringe. But public policy development, yeah. I, I, you know, I was very drawn to that. Yeah. You were a page. I was. I was I'm fortunate enough to have won that scholarship uh, in first year university, and uh, it was an extraordinary time. Actually, your father was there, and uh, he was very well respected. Uh, Thank you. He would often take his staff out uh, to the cafeteria, and uh, the other staffers would look longingly and say, <laughs> I just have As they got nice. a, an extra order of French fries or something. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, and so that was the time of the Charlottetown debate. Yeah. And uh, we were debating the universality of child benefits and how the crow flies for, um, uh, for payments on rail lines. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. I found it all very fascinating as a page and loved the late hour sittings. Why? Yeah. We were talking about, you know, at the time the constitutional debates yeah. were um, sort of the be-all, end-all for everyone. And it was, you know, as an 18-year-old, uh, we thought we were about to define what our nation would be for the next century. Mm -hmm. Of course, that didn't come to pass. But as an 18-year-old, you felt very honored to, to even stand on the floor of the House of Commons as others were debating that. It was truly an extraordinary experience. What did you feel like the first time you went into the House as a page? Was it a nerve-wracking experience, or did you feel that... Odd. Uh, odd? It's, it is a beautiful room. Yeah. And uh, to see the, the history there, um, you know, every single carving, every single painting has some depth, some meaning to it, has a backstory, And you're just so respectful for all of the work that went into this. Yeah. Did it influence the decision to go into politics? Because you, uh, you did become a municipal councillor in Mississauga for several years, um, but you would have had other options. So was the parliamentary page position one which was a defining moment in terms of your political activism, or was it just kind of a step along the way? You know, it was an extraordinary experience that paid for university. Right. <laughs> and there was the good point of it all. <laughs> good. Uh, so there was, you know, there was some reality to all of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, oh, you know, running municipally for the first time, that was actually a very unique experience. Mm -hmm. I was one of 21 candidates. And That's the, a lot of candidates. <laughs> the incumbent in Mississauga. Uh, you know, incumbents generally win re-election. Mm -hmm. And the incumbent there, though, had been uh, charged and, and convicted of extorting money from immigrants. Mm -hmm. and, and that Not was... Not a great platform to run on. No. And he was still running, and I think he finished fifth or sixth to me. Wow. Yeah. So how old were you when you first ran? Uh, good question. I, well, in Mississauga, it seems young. It's not that young by Canadian standards. I think about 28, 29. Okay. Uh, Mississauga, yeah. though, everybody was a grandmother. Yes. Or older, so. Um, so did they treat you like you were their granddaughter, or were they were they welcoming when? Oh, you mean? Oh, no. Yes, the, the, the other counselors. The, the other counselors. The were other all that colleagues. Is. Yeah. I did they like, treat you with respect? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, they're wonderful women. Yeah. Uh, wonderful, uh, strong women uh, who had all done well. Yeah. Uh, different life experiences. I think just about to a person, uh, most of them had first raised families before they went in, uh, and had careers of sure. their own. Uh, so it was unique and that I'd given birth on council. So that was right. a little unique. Um, can you tell me about your actual decision to run municipally as well? Because if you are facing a field of, you know, 20 other candidates, um, a lot of people would say this is an exercise in futility. This is really crazy. <laughs> Why are you doing this? 
What was it for you that made you decide to run? I think when I put my name in, there were already 16 folks. So you're right. Many people said, you know, it's quite the dog's breakfast there. Yeah. Uh, it was a compelling story for me. The the person, the fact that this person was still running. Yeah. Uh, you know, he would still give interviews, saying that uh, he deserves to be back on the job, uh, even though he'd been extorting money from immigrants. So a person wanted to start up a small business, and he said, you know, he would. Uh, well, he was convicted of saying uh, that uh, he would assist in that if they provided him with tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, he then had the money in his pocket and even paid his lawyer with those marked bills. Um, you know, so it was a very compelling story. It, it really struck a nerve with me. It was my parents um, had faced and, and shared those types of stories uh, that that type of thing would go on under uh, a regime where there truly isn't correct rule of law. And, you know, to have that happening in a modern Western country, in Canada's sixth largest city, um, it was very disappointing to say the least. Do you find yourself to be someone who seeks out injustices in that, in those types of circumstances and tries to right them? You know, when it comes to my constituents, I, I do find that I, I take on their issues and I want to advocate for them and I want to help them. And uh, I do want to wander through uh, the maze that sometimes seems to be government red tape to say, you know, it's actually quite possible. Let me help you here. Let me speak up for you. Let's get this fixed for you because you're right. Uh, with this can be better. This can be easier. Right. And too often people do find it uh, overwhelming or too sure. difficult uh, to succeed. And, and there are these great ideas that fall by the wayside uh, just because they don't know how to sort of navigate through some government red tape. Yeah. Yeah. Have you enjoyed the federal run so far? I mean, loving it. Okay, because it's a lot. It's um, it's not just a big uh, job to do, but there's a commute involved. You you lived and worked in the same place for so many years with a young child, and now you have the commute that's involved. You do still have uh, a young child. He's seven. Is yes, he just turned seven. Just turned seven. That's young. Oh, he's amazing. I bet he is truly just the the center of my life. You know what's nice about that, though, is that because he's young, this is normal for him, right? Always this has life. been. Yeah. He's been to town hall meetings since he was sure. first born, like literally in the stroller. Yeah. As I'd have an environmental assessment meeting or I'm town halling on a, a different issue where we're about to go out and community build. Um, but he's also been wonderful to have when we've gone municipally to different parks and trying out different play equipment. And, you know, that's how I modernized seven different parks in the municipality. Really? <laughs> Truly. You brought along your own test yes, subject. Yes. <laughs> What did you find interesting? What actually seemed safe? What was a concern? And you chat with other moms and dads there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But also, it gives you the motivation to say, you know, when I was a municipal councillor, we really do need to improve our community centre. We really do need to build a new library. We need an ambulance centre. And then this is where it will be. And I would always measure it. By the time my son is four years old, it will be built. And so you'd check in and you'd be memoed back and make sure your projects were on time and under budget. I'm proud to say every single one of my builds was under budget and on time. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> And you also, um, it would be hard to forget the date at which you had uh, promised that something would be done if it's always your son's exactly. birthday. Exactly. Yeah. It really does keep you in check. Did your family support your decision to run federally? You know, that one was a difficult one. Um, my mom, it was really tough for my mom. Um, because she would be further away. Yeah. Um, and my brothers, I think, were a little bit more supportive. I, I, they're all obviously proud, but we miss each other a lot. Yeah. yeah. Do you rely on them to help you with childcare and looking after? It's Jeffrey, right? Yes, Jeffrey. Look, looking after Jeffrey, or is do you feel when you leave for Ottawa that there isn't that weight on your chest weighing you down that so many parents feel that, you know, is everything in order? Is everything? Oh, I've brought him with me. You bring him with you? Oh, yes, yes, so yes. He I've put him here. in school here, yes. That's, so, I, it's sense. interesting. We, I, I often have these discussions with uh, members of parliament, both um, on the show and, and outside of the show, um, who weigh very heavily the decision as to whether they should keep their families in the riding or bring them here to Ottawa. And I think, truthfully, I, I always feel that if you can bring them to Ottawa, that it makes life a great deal easier uh, for everyone in the family. Oh, you're, you're right. Yeah. You're right. I mean, and you've experienced that firsthand. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was raised here, and we would go to the riding every weekend. Every uh, weekend. And yeah. my, my son is a great traveler. That's like, good. He's great in the car. <laughs> you know, he's got a lot of patience, so he yeah. will sit. It's, and it's not so bad. I mean, you had to go all the way out west. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, for us, it's about a four and a half, five hour drive, so it's not so bad. And you do the drive instead of a fly? We do both. So in the yeah. winter, perhaps fly or take the train more. Yeah. And then in the summer, we'll drive more. Right. Uh, but no, he's great. He was six when I first came here. So yeah. in this term of office, would be six to ten. And that's a huge chunk of his childhood to miss sure. out on day in, day out. So he goes to school here. Yeah. And then we go back every Friday. And, okay. um, and, and then what, what do you do when you're sitting late? Tough. It, yeah. Can it, you bring him in? I have. I have. Yeah. And in fact, there's, um, uh, there are these uh, sort of wonderful instances where I'm doing a late show, which means sort of the last debate of the night. Yes. And I come out of my, my son's and you don't know that you're going to be called up right. to do that. So it's difficult to plan to get a sitter last minute. Sure. And so, yes, I'll bring him to the lobby, and he has his books there and so on. And, and a pillow and a blanket? Yes, and he's very good. He sits right there, and he'll play, and he'll read, and he'll draw, and I'll pop back out. And so it was one day I came out, and uh, he told me the story about how the prime minister had been there. And I thought, well, I think what he meant was that he had seen the prime minister on a television screen. Yes. And um, so I, I thought nothing of it. And so the next day, I think we were in for late votes. And then again, I had a, a late speech. And it was a last minute thing, as we had. Like, for instance, last night, we had last minute votes called. Yeah. And I wander out, and uh, there's this big crowd. Um, but they've all kept a bit of space around a couch. And there's the prime minister chatting with my son. <laughs> so that's wander. really fun. It and is. of course, your son, that's totally normal. Well, I, yeah. No, I think he knew it was a great experience, yeah. but he wasn't quite as phased as just about everyone else was. <laughs> and very sweet of the Prime Minister. That's really nice. But, but, but we make it work, right? So I, I'll usually finish work around 6 or so, uh, go home, make dinner, be with him, read to him, draw with him. In the summer, we'll go out do tea ball or something. Or we had last night, we had a play date over, so his friend came over to our home. Yeah. He's in bed by about 8.15, 8.30. Sure. And, and then I'll keep working until about 11, right? So that's when I do my desk work return some phone calls and send my emails. Yeah. Those are long days, though. But are you used you to long what? days, or do you not mind it? My, my parents did it decades ago. Right. Right? And they really did. And all sorts of parents are doing that across the country. And in the GTA, um, most families, uh, it's both parents work in order to pay that mortgage. Uh, so that actually is the norm. Yeah. And you, you make it work, right? And you have these great life experiences. Like, sure. You have a lot of fun. Like, you know, yesterday I was chasing him around with a water gun. Sure. But so, you wouldn't give up. I, I, would, I can't imagine having him back in the riding and only catching up with him on the weekend. Yeah, like the, absolutely. It'd be terrible. I, I, I mean, for a young child, it would just be, uh, for both of you, it would not be any fun at all. No, it, it would define him. And yeah. It would be heart-wrenching for me. Yeah. yeah. So this is what works for us. All sorts of families come up with what works for them. Yes. Uh, and it, it's this wonderful honor. At the end of the day, this is an exceptional honor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about, a lot of people feel that there is um, a lot of partisanship on the Hill, which would be different from, I assume would be different from what you saw as a counselor. Um, is it easy to navigate on the Hill? Are you able to make friends with people from other parties and to find commonalities with people from different political stripes? Or are they more silos on the Hill? Uh, you are right in that it was easier to cobble together alliances uh, going in for votes municipally, right? Because you would look at things in terms of quality of life for your residents. Uh, you could easily sort of present an argument as long as you've done solid homework. People would feel confident in placing, in placing their vote with you. Um, because it would reflect well upon them when they sought re-election, right? And it would be difficult for them to somehow argue that, uh, you know, just on a matter of principle, they needed to oppose you when you were, let's say, building an ambulance station, right? right. And you'd put together the funding for that, especially when it was in property tax-based funding. Mm -hmm. So so there it, it's much easier to just walk up to the person that you're working with and reason with them and say, this is why it's in your best interest, and most importantly, this is why it's in the best interest of our taxpayers. Uh, and that was a pretty easy sell, right? And, and you could work and you could achieve a lot. Here, um, I, I think that you do uh, socialize and, and you'll meet with folks across the aisle and it's, it's more personal. Uh, certainly when they see my child, mm -hmm. uh, people are chattier. Some feel guiltier. I, I know some oh, that have called really? those late night votes, look and say, yep, no, we're, we're really forcing her through all of this. Yeah. Um, but you know what? This is democracy and how extraordinary. Uh, that we have the opportunity to do that. Does it have a particular resonance to you when you talk about democracy in that regard because of what you um, not just have heard from your parents, but what you've, how hard you've seen them work in order to survive in a country 
that offered them democracy. That I mean, that was really the reason for coming because they had the option, they had the opportunity to live in a democratic society. It is. Does that make? Absolutely. Does that touch on what you do every Absolutely. day? Absolutely. That there is rule of law. That you can count on the fact that there are rules out there, um, that if you follow, you can actually succeed. That everything's transparent and there's stability. Um, and, and that's really, you know, what, what so many people want. They just want to know, what are the rules governing this? Um, and I'll go. I'll work awfully hard. I just want to succeed, and I want to be able to rely on the fact that these rules aren't going to haphazardly uh, change just because, you know, it's, it, it tickles someone's fancy. Right. Um, we really underestimate just how important that is. And we, we talk about negotiating free trade agreements right now, and we're undertaking some of the most ambitious free trade negotiations as a country. Um, but that's part and parcel. I mean, Canadians have got great products, great services uh, that they could go and sell overseas. Uh, the challenge, though, is that there might not um, be the rule of law. They, they can't count on the fact that uh, if they need to find a legal recourse in order to go and get their accounts receivable paid up, uh, that they can go there as a foreign national and make sure that the courts apply the law to them. And, and that's what we're doing as a nation when we go out and we negotiate a free trade agreement. We're saying these are going to be the rules that, that govern you, and if you'd like to go compete, by all means go and create some prosperity for yourself, your family, for our neighbors. And so on a very small scale, that's exactly what my parents were looking to do here. They just want to know what the rules were and work hard and try and deliver a better life for their family. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable that... Yeah. Uh, that I'd have the opportunity to work on the other end of that. Tell me what you do um, when you do get some time to yourself. Do you have, are you able to pursue interests, whether that's reading or movies or sports? Do you have anything that you can do in this life that gives you some balance or no? <laughs> no, I'm getting the no vibe. <laughs> reading, reading memos and breaking <laughs> notes to the account? It doesn't count. Well, it doesn't count. <laughs> So no, um, at the moment you have no life outside of uh, really you know, you the have political and the mom. The mom, the mom thing, right? Yeah. Every time I have free time, I, I do want to be with him, right? So we're heavily involved in T-ball right now. Sure. And uh, Pokemon was the big thing. And before that, it was Thomas the Train or Star Wars. And so, yeah, I have to immerse myself in all that and make sure that, uh, that when my son wants to chat with me about these things, that I'm the cool mom. Wow, you are up to date then. You are <laughs> no. up to date. Yeah. So um, quickly, just before we end, uh, best moments in the house, worst moments in the house. Have you had those yet? Uh, best moment of the house has to be coming out and seeing my son just chit-chatting with the Prime Minister. That was a, a little surreal. Yeah. Uh, worst moments in the house? No, you know what? It, it's all in our... 26-hour I mean, marathon boats? I was actually on house duty before that, so for oh. me it was 38 or Fantastic. some such. So we stopped counting because it just got a little too... Upsetting? Yes. Or, or just exhausting? Yes. yes. Wow. But you know what? And so you had to stand. You couldn't roam around. And I remember the night we finally got home. Yes. I remember, wow, I, I can actually walk 10 feet. I don't have to ask permission. <laughs> it's very liberating. No, it's all great. I mean, at the end of the day, we're openly voting, freely voting. Yeah. And how great is that? I don't think there can be a bad day in the House of Commons. Eve Adams, thank you very much for taking the time to be here today. I really do appreciate it. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you.